Morning. Um, we're coming to you live from my 1969 Chrysler Newport. I'm going to do a little like a Matt Farah-ish one take, except probably worse. Um, I have the keys here. Keys on the left, like a Porsche. And before you can drive this car, you have to start it. And it's a big V8 and it has no chokes, which means there's a lot of pump action going on to start it. Um, I haven't driven this car in probably two, three days. We'll see if it turns over. Almost. It wants to start. Yeah, there's a lot of <laughs> pump action. So this car, while it's warming up, is a uh, 383 big block, two barrel carb. Um, it makes 290 gross horsepower, which is probably like 240, 250 net horsepower. Uh, but it makes a lot of torque. I don't remember the exact number, but it's around, I wanna say 350, 380, something in there. Um, it's a strong engine. This car, <clears throat> it's actually like the base model Chrysler. It's funny because it seems hilarious, but uh, it, uh, it's got wind-up windows, AM radio, cloth seats, as you can see, um, and the base engine, which is a 383 big block, which I find sort of hilarious. Um, this car cost about $3,500, $3,800 when it was new. Um, I guess the modern equivalent would be like a... Uh, Chrysler 300C, like a mid $30,000 luxury-ish car. Um, <laughs> certainly no comparison in terms of handling. Right, let's pull it out. So as you can hear, it's really sluggish before it's warmed up. My house was built in 1886, before the automobile, as my very narrow garage can attest. I think it was built with Model A's in mind. So the, this uh, car I've had for about about a year now, I think. I think I bought it about last summer. Uh, it had been sitting in a parking garage for about seven to 10 years and it hadn't moved, hadn't been driven. And so it needed a lot of little things to make it into a running, driving car. Uh, just little things, you know, filters, all the brake pads, like the entire braking system had to be gone through. Oh. Sometimes reverse engages a little rough when it's cold. There's no Suburban. So the interesting thing about this car, I've had it like a lot of, driven a lot of old cars, is that this handles bad for old car standards. Uh, everyone says, I mean, everyone knows old cars handle bad and old sedans handle bad as well. But this is possibly the scariest handling car I have ever driven. Uh, Chrysler used torsion beam suspension in the front <laughs> on everything uh, that from the dart all the way up to this massive Chrysler. It's got big torsion bars up front. And the result is that the steering feel is absolutely nautical. <laughs> I used to drive a 1966 Impala and that felt like a Miata compared to the <laughs> to this thing, but it's it's not a car you would drive for the handling uh, for say it's not exactly that type of car um, It is a lot faster than the old Impala the uh, v8 It's pretty mellow. You know it warms up really slow. It's got a lot of oil to circulate But uh, once it warms up and the carb kind of gets comes up to temperature it it really scoots. It's a fun car to drive And negotiating Toronto traffic the other thing is you can't see it, um, but there's a little trafficator on the front left fender there. The idea being that this thing is so massive, you want to like have corner markers like a boat. I find it kind of hilarious. Uh, turn signal is also not self-canceling. You have to hold it down for your signal to work. And it's a muggy day in Toronto and this car does not have air conditioning. So I'm going to die today.
So this car is pretty much, I'm not gonna say original, I've replaced a lot of things, but it's the original specification. I haven't really upgraded anything. Uh, we're still using the four drum brakes, which are massive on each side, and they're really cool, like finned in the front. I think they're cast iron drums. Uh, but they're, <laughs> they stop you really well once. Like on the highway, like you'll lock up tires, and you can stop from 60 miles an hour, but they get hot very quickly, and they're definitely more suited to highway or to uh, to city driving over highway. And I wouldn't really want to find their limits on a mountain road. But for a hidden here in the city, my dirty windows, it's not bad. <laughs> it all works pretty well, and nothing copes with Toronto's crappy potholes and streets like this car. Uh, it is a very wide car, even for like ginormous 1960s standards. And the weird thing about these Chryslers is that they're actually unibody. There's no body on frame. This is all one gigantic unibody car. I think the only bigger unibody car I can think of is the, uh, I think it's the 58 or 59 uh, Lincolns were all unibody, and those were a bit bigger. But this is a, this is a solid 19 foot long vehicle. Um, I think I measured it once to get it in my garage, and I think it measured it at about six and a half feet wide, six, uh, six feet five inches or something. It's a very large car. And the remarkable thing about that is that it doesn't exactly translate into interior room. Um, as you can see, the steering wheel's in my lap. My elbows can touch the wheel. The back seats uh, are pretty spacious, but it has, you know, for all of its size, for all of its mass, it doesn't really translate into seat room. It is. We will seat six people though. It has a giant bench. Uh, this armrest here folds up and you'll definitely get three or four people in the back. You know, seat belts optional, I guess. But uh, it's pretty much the ideal car if you want to pack a bunch of people and cruise around. It's kind of where it excels. As you can hear, rattles like a tin can full of bolts. <laughs> Chrysler assembly quality was maybe not the best. Although they did get the, the big things right, the engine still works, trans, I mean, mechanically it's solid, but it's got little trim things that rattle everywhere. Um, this is kind of the tail end for quality in American luxury cars, I would say. Mid 60s was about the peak. Cadillac and Chrysler were making some really cool stuff, especially the Imperials. Um, but by about the late 60s, it kind of started to trail off. The interior gets more plasticky, but uh, it's still a really fun car to have. The other thing is, um, you know, this was a whole new car for 1969. Chrysler tends to oscillate wildly between really out of state styling and way too modern, way too futuristic styling. For example, you had the 66 generation, 1966 generation, uh, basically straight edge cars, not a single curve on them, straight grills, straight fender lines, straight waist lines, really, really, really angular cars. I think they built one into the, uh, the I forget what it was, the Green Hornets car? Anyways, um, really angular. And then of course, they made those up to 1968. And in 1969, they swapped to this style, which is of course, a completely curved, they call it the fuselage style because the outside of the car is one unbroken curve. Um, it's supposed to maximize interior room, which may or may not have actually worked. But uh, it actually was a fairly futuristic thing and I, I'd compare the size of it to the, uh, the 928 actually also has a really smooth uh, exterior curve. But the difference, it just was too modern for the times. And the other thing is that the idea was that it was an unbroken curve from the roof down to the rocker panels. But they sold most of these with vinyl roofs, which break up that line, so it kind of didn't work. And of course, the dealers always sold them with vinyl roofs to tag up the price, and it just didn't really translate that well. Um, but <laughs> they, did sell, um, they did sell quite a few of these, but the survival rates are so low. Nobody wants to see bodies. People usually, because they're unibody, people usually, once the rust got too bad, they just junked them. And the other problem was that because they all, every single one of these came with a big block in the early years, I mean, later, you, later on you could get <clears throat> small block V8s and even slant sixes if you were really brave, but most of these had big blocks and they were undesirable big sedans. And back in the 70s and 80s, 
uh, a lot of these lost their engines to be put into darts and road runners because they're big strong engines uh, this one has survived actually it's an original thunder bay car which is bought up in northern ontario um, it's been an ontario car its whole life how it escaped the salt i do not know but it is a completely rust-free car um, it's the most <laughs> rust-free thing i've ever owned um, it has a, it, yeah it's an interesting canadian spec car I do wonder who would have bought this. Who says, I have to have a full-size Chrysler, it has to have a big block, but I don't want to spend any, <laughs> I don't spend any money on it otherwise. Um, this is actually the Newport Custom, <clears throat> which is silly, but anyways, the Newport Custom was a trim level above the base Newport. I don't always call it a Newport Custom because it sounds a bit pretentious and you always have to explain it to people. Uh, but the Newport Custom had nicer cloth seats and a different grille, and that's about all I can find out about it. It seems to be almost exactly the same as a Newport, except it has a little different badge and not much else. Um, it's a um, four-door post car, it's because it has the B-pillar behind me. You could have also got these as a four-door coupe, which was the um, <clears throat> no B-pillar, open, open, uh, open there. Uh, they also came as a two-door coupe and as a convertible. Uh, honestly, I, I prefer the lines of the four-door a bit better. It has a longer roof. Uh, what they actually did for the two-door is they actually <laughs> shrank the greenhouse even more. Uh, so you get this really, really long-looking trunk, like even longer than the aircraft deck I have behind me currently. All right, let's see if it's warmed up enough to give it some stick. All right, so the kick-down switch, all right. Now, see how it almost died? You really have to warm it up a long time before you can floor it. Uh, it usually takes a solid 30, 40 minutes of driving. Maybe it's a carb tuning issue, maybe it's an old car thing. It doesn't bother me that much. It drives fine at part throttle. Uh, you just have to let it warm up pretty well before you want to, <laughs> before you floor it. Why is this whistling? There we go. Well, using all four drum brakes now to stop for this yellow light. Another weird thing is that the seat belts um, are actually shoulder belts. I have my lap belt down here, and up here, I don't know if you can see, but there's the shoulder belt, and it clips in way back here. Now the idea was that you'd clip your lap belt, and then you would clip your shoulder belt, and both of these things manually adjust like you would on an airplane seat. So when you use that, it's kind of like wearing a straight jacket because it doesn't adjust. So once you tie yourself in, you want to move to adjust the radio, you can't. It's really a pain, and so as a result, I don't use it ever. Um, maybe I should, but I never use it, and it even has these little clips up here, which allows you to clip the shoulder belt out of the way, because even Chrysler knew you wouldn't use it. <laughs> even they realized it was kind of a dumb design. Uh, gauges are pretty limited. There's a lot of idiot lights. I have a fuel gauge, I have a speedometer, and I have, oddly, a, um, a voltmeter. Um, but, so there's no tack. I really have no idea what this big engine is doing. It's not geared really low. I would guess this thing has 308 or 330 gears in it. <clears throat> but uh, it, it's geared fairly low, but you do hear it spinning uh, kind of fast on the highway. But the beauty of a Chrysler like this is that you never feels stressed at any speed. We're doing 50 miles an hour now. This thing's probably doing 2,000 RPM and third, it just wafts along. Uh, you can see how it's steering angle I have to put in to go around an average turn on a boulevard. Uh, a fun game to play in your Chrysler is how many turns of the wheel will it take to perform parking lot maneuvers. Sometimes it's more than six. I don't know how many times this thing spins around, but it's a lot. Um, at speed, the car feels solid. It's also really, really quiet. I don't know if you can hear it, but uh, there's not really any wind noise. I have the windows up for sound quality because I'm melting. But uh, I feel like in older cars, they design them to work with the windows down. When you roll the windows down in this car, you don't get a lot of that buffeting, that, uh, that drumming effect you get with a lot of newer cars. Uh, and this thing, you put the windows down, you can drive at 60 miles an hour and have a talk with your passenger. I think they just designed them to kind of work with the windows down. Maybe I'm a little crazy. 
Uh, is this how? Is this the classic car for you? Um, well, as long as you don't have any pretensions about it ever being sporty in any way other than straight. <laughs> yeah, see what I mean about the steering wheel angle here? Uh, as long as you don't have any pretensions about it being fast in any way except straight, it's quite fun. Um, it, <laughs> it's a powerful car if you want to. You can lay a patch of rubber at any stoplight. Um, it scoots in a straight line. Uh, it's just a cruiser. It's a relaxing car. When you floor it in this car, it se seems to make this face and go, you really want to do that? It's not the, uh, the speed demon car. But it's great for cruising around the city. It's really comfortable. Um, you also never run out of room. I like to bike a lot, and I just put my entire bike in the trunk. Uh, so there's not a whole lot of classics you can do that with. Uh, Price-wise, these are still really affordable. Um, you can still pick up one of these old Chryslers for not a whole lot of money. You know, five grand gets you a really nice one, and it's a really cool way to get into the hobby. Um, obviously, if you're looking for a sports car or a muscle car, it's not that. But if you just want a cool old car to drive around in, it's pretty good. Now we come to the lowest point of the Chrysler review, which is the fuel economy. When I first bought this, it uh, was out of tune. It still ran and drove, but it needed a tune. Uh, and that first fill up, I got six miles to the gallon, which I didn't even know was possible. I think semi trucks get about that. Um, <laughs> that was my first fill up. Um, I had my mechanic, who's an old school genius, tune the carburetor with a stethoscope. He's really good at it. Um, so we tuned the carb, and now it gets 10, 12 on a good day. Um, highway mileage, I haven't really driven it on the highway enough to know, but I'm gonna guess it gets about 13. This engine really doesn't seem to care if you're flooring it, driving on the highway, driving in the city. It's because it's gear, the way it's, uh, it's such a low revving engine, it's pretty much just idling all the time. Um, but 12 miles to the gallon is about to be expected. Uh, it does, the other thing is, it, uh, it's a, I think it's nine to one compression, nine or 10 to one. It likes to drink mid-grade. If you run it on regular, it pings a bit. Um, so you have to run it on the, uh, not premium, but the mid-grade gas. Just costs a bit more. Uh, this one has had the, uh, the valves, the valve seats redone. But if you haven't had your valve seats redone, it's something you want to do for any old car, or else you can't run it on the regular unleaded gas. This one has had the valve seats done. I run it on regular. I don't have to run a lead additive, which is a blessing. But now I'm at the grocery store, which is where I drove today. Um, I hope you enjoy this little walk and talk of this uh, Chrysler. It's kind of give you a sense of what it's like to drive and live with. Um, I apologize for my, stu <laughs> my stutters. I uh, hope you tune in. I uh, might do this with some other cars I can get my hands on. And thanks for watching. Have a good one.